All right, thank you very much, uh, Jeff, uh, and uh, thanks for being here. It's a pleasure to be at UC San Diego for the first time uh, and to uh, tell you a little bit about what uh, the, the research that we've been doing over the past uh, five years or so. Um, so, uh, as Jeff mentioned, I am an assistant professor uh, at the University of Maryland College Park. Uh, I'm part of the Maryland Cybersecurity Center, which is the research group focusing on security at UMD. Um, and because I am a professor, I'm going to start my talk with a quiz. Okay, so I have this uh, question for you guys, uh, which is uh, how vulnerable you are to malware. Uh, and more precisely, um, uh, can you think of, you know, uh, you know if you, if, if you were to look on the posts in, in all the countries around the world, um, and you took the average per country in terms of how much malware there is on those hosts, what would be the country that would be at the top? Or what would be the countries in the top five? I'm, I'm asking, it's, it is a quiz, right? <laughs> Any thoughts, anything comes to mind? Countries where there's a lot of malware on. United States, okay, okay, so that's one. Okay, let's, let's try to get five. Taiwan. Taiwan, okay. Uh, I don't think I've heard that one before, but okay, okay, yes. <laughs> India, okay, India. Um, I mean, don't just say your country of origin. Like, think, think which one might be the, the one. Uh, yeah. Iran. Iran. Is this a percentage or total? Uh, it's average per host. Average count. Average, co average count per host. Are these places you count? Uh, yeah, we could not count in all places, yes. China, okay, China, okay, yes. Nepal. Nepal, okay. I think we're we're at five now, okay. All right, so <laughs> you guys are better than most. Uh, so uh, we actually know because we measured this, right? So we looked at um, the amount of malware on four, four million hosts in 44 countries. So yeah, I mean, we didn't like on some we couldn't measure on how, on some we did not have enough data. Right, so we took only the countries from which we had, I think, only at least 500 hosts. Uh, and, um, uh, and this is part of something, we published this uh, uh, report called the Global Cyber Vulnerability Report. And uh, usually, like, we've, we've been you know, running this exercise asking people in a variety of settings, industry, uh, government, military, uh, you know, research conferences in machine learning, in security, and usually, um, uh, so you guys actually got some of the, the countries in the top five, but usually people come up with some countries from the Western world, right? The, the United States, the UK, I don't know, France maybe. Uh, and uh, top five turn out to be these in order. South Korea. South Korea, India, Saudi Arabia, China, Malaysia, and Russia. All right, let's drop Russia. <laughs> this is top five, okay? Because they're in order. I'm sure the last two were. These are six, okay? All right. You, you simulated a real quiz very well. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing works, you know, like uh, <laughs> unless you expose it to a lot of, large number of people. Um, so, um, so yeah. So just to put things a, a little bit into context, right? If you were to rank the hosts, from the host that has the most amount of malware on it to the ones that have zero malware, right? And you looked at the, the middle of the ranking, right? So the median amount of malware, like what, what, would, what would it be? What would be at the number? In, in terms of unique samples, right? What do you think? Median across all hosts? Across the four billion, yes. Across, across the, these 44 countries that we have. So and at one, at one moment in time, or median over the is zero? Uh, at one moment in time, yes, one year, right? So we did this uh, two years, I think. We looked at um, we looked at twenty, I think, twenty fourteen and twenty fifteen. But, but are you asking at any moment in time how many are there, or over those two years how many? Oh, over those two years, oh, over each year, over each year, right? Because we did it, yeah, separately. So, yeah, okay, that is actually the right answer. Uh, <laughs> it is zero, <laughs> right? 
Uh, so to put things in a little bit into context, uh, in the United States, 55% of the hosts have at least one malware sample on them, which is not, it's a little worse than the median, right? So the United States is actually not too bad in this ranking. Um, in contrast, in South Korea, it was 90% of the hosts. It had at least one sample of malware on them, right? Um, so uh, this, uh, the reason why I'm, uh, yeah, oh, right, so the, yeah, so the United States is uh, number 10 uh, in the rank from the safest, uh, right? Yes? So that way it's a pretty broad yeah. term, and it has a multitude of sins. Yeah, yeah. So Yeah, it, it includes adware, yeah. And some of it is going to be, you know, uh -huh. so stuff Google will call potentially yeah. online programs, yeah. and then over here there'll be stuff that steals your credit card information and yeah, 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 yeah. encrypts your disk. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, right. Does the ranking stay the same? That's an excellent question. Actually, I think it is in, so we did, did the, we did the uh, uh, breakdown in, in, the, in the report. Um, I... Uh, I think there weren't very big differences uh, in terms of specific categories of what at the time we considered malware, but now actually, you know, you're right, people are much more careful in distinguishing between PUP, potentially unwanted programs, and, and actual malware. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I don't think there was a significant sort of concentration of a particular type in, in any geographical uh, region. Um, but that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good point. But the reason, you know, I, the reason why I'm s showing you this is not to claim that this is a particularly good measure of security, uh, but, uh, you know, just to point out that, you know, this uh, sort of very different uh, amount of uh, susceptibility, if you want, or this different amount of, of malware observed on, on, on these uh, different hosts on different countries, points to the observation that we are actually dealing with a wide range of adversary capabilities, right? So if, if adversaries were capable uh, of uh, sort of uh, breaking into these hosts, um, uh, and, you know, if, distribu if distribution was, was, uh, uh, was, was sort of uniform, then we would uh, expect to see a sort of a uniform uh, uh, distribution of this, uh, this uh, malware. Uh, but the distribution we see is anything but uniform. So there are, there are differences that we observe by looking at this data in the wild in what the adversaries are able to do or willing to do. So that is the first, um, uh, and perhaps you know, by, by trying to understand these differences, uh, we, can do, we can improve security. We can, uh, uh, we can uh, come up with defenses that perhaps are better uh, answering the actual capabilities that the adversaries have in the, in the, in the real world. And uh, the other observation is that uh, often when asked uh, about uh, what is the most uh, infected country, people would come up with uh, uh, an answer like the United States. Um, and uh, you know, if you actually quantify it, this, is, this, is not actually, uh, this does not actually match this, this expectation. Uh, so there is a, a difference, a clear difference that we can see between the uh, perceived uh, security and uh, security that we can quantify according to objective metrics. Uh, and because a lot of the times decisions about how to develop certain secure systems or how to deploy security measures are based on the perceived subjective perceptions, um, trying to, to quantify them uh, and to do them in a, in a more data-driven uh, fashion uh, uh, provides an opportunity to, uh, um, uh, to try to address these, these range of adversary cap capabilities a little bit better. So this was uh, just my attempt to motivate the, the field that I'm working on, which is data-driven security. These, these are the kinds of, of benefits that that this research can uh, can provide. Uh, of course, a lot of people here at UCSD are, are working in this uh, uh, in this uh, in this area, so uh, it feels like I'm preaching a little bit to the choir. 
but in general, this, these are, uh, this is the general uh, area that, that, I've been, that I've been working on over the past uh, few years. So, uh, you know, I try to look at real world adversaries from a global perspective, because in order to, uh, you know, observe these range of adversary capabilities, uh, we want to measure these systematically. Uh, in order to be able to come up with these, these uh, methods to, to quantify, uh, you know, uh, the exposure or security risk. Uh, and then we also uh, throw in some machine learning because it's cool. <laughs> no, it's, uh, so we actually, uh, the reason why we use machine learning is because uh, in many cases the factors that turn out to be uh, good predictors for 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 these uh, uh, adversary behaviors are surprising, and uh, if you do it in a data-driven fashion, you can get new uh, new insights into what's going on. Uh, so this is sort of a broad sort of uh, uh, list of publications in these areas. Uh, in this talk, I will focus more specifically on a few uh, specific uh, uh, samples and. Uh, I will start with uh, the wine platform, which is, I think, uh, Jeff already alluded to, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's this, this platform that allowed us to do these, uh, these large-scale and systematic measurements of, uh, of security. <clears throat> um, so before I was a professor at UND, I was working at Semantic Research Labs, and uh, at uh, SRL, uh, I built this platform called Wine, uh, that uh, essentially, uh, you know, uh, collected a sample of the data that Symantec uh, uh, products around the world could observe on those end hosts. And actually, the, you know, the numbers that I pre presented on the first slide actually come from this uh, from this platform. So there's a number of uh, data sets. Uh, uh, telemetry received from these uh, uh, these products, including. Uh, Antivirus telemetry, so each time an antivirus detects something, it, you know, the semantic receives an, they call it an AV ping. Uh, download telemetry uh, basically indicates which files, executable files are being downloaded on those hosts, whether they are known to be malicious or not. And there's a few other data sets. So this was a, a large, uh, um, uh, a large data set that was available uh, that, you know, uh, provided some unique uh, perspectives to researchers in academia at the time. Um, also, it, it um, so instead of actually making the data available as itself, we built a platform, which is actually what I'm showing here. This is the actual hardware for Wine that I put together myself. Uh, and. Uh, some of the cool things for, for, for security was that this allowed us to update the data continuously, right? So as, uh, as, th as threats evolved, uh, we could feed in new data so the researchers could always gain access to the latest, uh, the latest data. Um, and uh, also because all the data was uh, on, uh, on this platform and then um, uh, Symantec could in, enforce certain uh, access controls uh, that allowed us to, uh, to preserve user privacy. So for example, the researchers could only take uh, aggregates out of the system but not the raw data itself. Um, so uh, this, uh, this system has been used uh, uh, in, uh, in lots of papers. Uh, so actually it stopped working in 2017, uh, the hardware was, became obsolete, so this, this is not functional anymore, but uh, it, the data itself was used uh, in papers that even today we're actually seeing some papers uh, that uh, are coming out uh, using, using uh, this data. Um, uh, some of these are my papers, but not all of them. Uh, I remember even Jeff had a student at some point who came and, uh, and ran some experiments on wine, so. Uh, and it also influenced uh, what today is called threat intelligence. So threat intelligence is a, you know, this, this uh, new sort of uh, uh, sector segment in the security industry which focuses on sharing data uh, for, uh, for profit and you can think of Wine as an early um, sort of threat intelligence platform. All right, so uh, just to put this a little bit into context, right, so we wanna do both measurements that are both global and systematic. 
right? And you know, if we take a little bit, uh, a, a, a look a little bit at the, uh, at the broader security research, right, we definitely have a lot of very remarkable measurements of malware ecosystems, many of them actually done here at UCSD, uh, but you know, truly remarkable experiments um, that looked into um, malware behavior, malware dis the dissemination, the, the black market, um, and the problem is that uh, these required a lot of effort for the data collection, and then uh, repeating this, uh, this, this effort was, was very difficult, right? So trying to uh, ask research questions systematically uh, on these data sets was, was difficult because basically you would have to, for the next paper, somebody else would have to re, uh, you know, redo the whole data collection. Uh, now we do have uh, in security an approach to run experiments systematically, and this is by using network scanning. So tools such as ZMAP and Census uh, allowed essentially scanning the entire IPv4 address space in a very short amount of time, so you could discover which hosts are vulnerable, which web certificates have been you know, uh, compromised or abused in some way, uh, and, uh, and these have you know, later then uh, led to a lot of efforts to improve, for example, the, the, the web PKI. Um, but the problem is that with network scanning, uh, it's hard to see what's happening on, on, on the end host itself. So it's hard to ask research questions um, about malware, for example. Uh, so, you know, questions such as the, the one that I asked on the first, uh, on the first slide. Uh, so Wine allowed us to do, uh, to do both. Um, so to do systematic and global uh, measurements for, uh, for things that you observe on, on end hosts. To, and to give you just one quick example, uh, in uh, 2012, we had this uh, paper where we measured the duration of zero day attacks. Uh, we used Wine for this. So what is a zero-day attack? So a zero-day attack is a vulnerability, a software vulnerability that is exploited in the wild before uh, this vulnerability is disclosed publicly. So in this case, the hackers discovered the, you know, the, you know, the flaw before the sec security community did, right? So it's basically before day zero, which is considered to be the disclosure date. Uh, and famously, the Stuxnet worm. Has everybody heard of Stuxnet? Is anybody who did not hear of Stuxnet? Okay, so uh, this Stuxnet worm, which was the most sophisticated piece of malware at the time, uh, and uh, uh, it reportedly uh, targeted and uh, successfully uh, industrial control systems. Uh, the, uh, uh, um, so it remained actually, one interesting uh, thing about Stuxnet it was that it performed this job undetected for about, for a bit over one year, right? Uh, and one of the reasons why it was able to do that was because it included four zero-day exploits. So it was able to penetrate those systems and propagate uh, in a very stealthy manner because at the time nobody knew that there was a vulnerability, no, nobody was looking for an exploit. So then, uh, in the security community for a long time, uh, there was this question, how long can zero-day ex exploits can go on undetected? Right? So from the time when the exploit appears in the wild uh, to the time when the vulnerability is, is finally disclosed. And uh, there were sort of very wild uh, estimations run ranging from one month to several several years, and Wine actually allowed us to, to do this. I'm not gonna go into the details of how exactly we identified uh, these vulnerabilities. I can tell you afterward if you're, if you're interested, but basically we, uh, we used, we combined the different telemetry data sets in, in, in Wine to find traces of the exploit uh, on some hosts in the wild uh, before the corresponding vulnerability was disclosed, and then we, we measured that, that uh, that uh, time span, we found 18 vulnerabilities that had uh, evidence uh, of, of zero-day exploits. Interestingly, uh, uh, more than half of them were, they, so these were known vulnerability, but they were not known to have been exploited before their disclosure. So, uh, um, and, and the, the average uh, attack duration uh, turned out to be about 312 days. So, 
the interesting thing about this is that in, in the way we did our, our measurement, this measurement cannot find all exploits for all the vulnerabilities, but specifically it, it can find exploits that are delivered through executable binaries, such as Stuxnet. And for these kinds of, uh, you know, the, the, these are, you know, these, these are the kinds of vulnerabilities that you may not be able to find through through uh, network scanning, so and, and for which you actually need end host data. So this is this is the role that Wine uh, played in this in this particular study. Uh, so uh, this is actually the the distribution. It, it looks like this uh, of the duration. Right, so uh, most of them seem to be, you know, discovered within one year with a long tail. Some of them actually stay uh, undiscovered for a long time. Uh, and the uh, the other interesting observation here is that for uh, all but two of these uh, vulnerabilities, uh, we found the exploit uh, on fewer than 150 hosts out of the 10 million that we examined in this uh, in this work. Uh, uh, which suggests that uh, if you were to try to use a different methodology that, that perhaps used less data, right? So uh, uh, using honeypots or, you know, you're very unlikely to see uh, evidence of these exploits in those data sets. So uh, this is something that you were, for which you actually really need data analysis on a, on a, on a global scale. So uh, these are uh, basically a couple of, uh, I just wanted to illustrate with this uh, example the, 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 the new sort of unique capabilities that, that Wine enabled. Uh, we actually did a lot of follow-on work on, uh, on, um, uh, uh, on the life cycle of vulnerabilities and then the impact that it has uh, in the real world. Uh, so uh, we found, we measured the zero-day exploits. In a subsequent program, we measured the, the patching rates. So every day we measure the vulnerable population on uh, uh, for uh, about 1,600 vulnerabilities in 10 Windows uh, client applications. Uh, and we compared it with the dates when um, exploits came out for those vulnerabilities. And the, the median was uh, that 86%. Uh, the median across all those exploited vulnerabilities was 86% uh, of hosts unpatched. So the, this, this shows, you know, that the reason why, so most exploits, most vulnerabilities are exploited after disclosure, and, and this, is, this is why, because those exploits are still really uh, effective. They find large vulnerable populations when they, when they come out. Stefan. It's a long tail. It's a long, yeah. Oh, so it varies, right? So, uh, so for zero-day vulnerabilities, it's zero-day. It's uh, it's a hundred percent, right? Some of them were a few hundred days. Um, um, I have well, we have we have. So it, it varies basically, right? It's not one specific date, right? But but uh, so, you know, the patching patterns are actually really interesting because uh, they vary a lot across hosts and also across products. Uh, we had Google Chrome in our data, which uh, was the first program that had uh, silent updates from the from the very first version. So the idea was that you don't even ask the user; you just update the thing, right? So then, when 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 the the program is rebooted, you get the new version automatically, and that clearly had the best patching rate uh, across all the um, uh, all the applications that that we had. Uh, but um, uh, if you look at the, um, so if you look at the decline of the vulnerable population, the sur survival curve. Um, is, so reaching 50% of the vulnerable population, it's, they usually do it in a few days with silent updates. But then if you look at the higher percentiles, and 90%, it still takes them hundreds of days to reach that, that level of patching. It's a little bit hard to, to find one specific uh, cause for this, and I think that what happens is that the, the reason for the long tail is that, you know, many things can fail, right? So when many things can fail, you know, this, there's a combination that uh, allows some, you know, you, you can actually address some of, one of these, these issues, but the long tail persists because you have other reasons why some, some hosts may not be, uh, may not be updated. And um, we had a lot of interesting findings in this paper. One of them was that 
a vulnerability may affect the host multiple times because you have, it's perhaps it's in some library that multiple applications use, or you people had multiple versions of Flash, uh, one for each browser plus a standalone version, all updated with different update mechanisms, right? So uh, there are, uh, but, but the most interesting thing, in, in my opinion, was that there is high variability across hosts, even for the same, for patching the same vulnerability. And you know, some of the, the factors that, that, that influence this, this patching rate, uh, uh, we, we actually started uh, understanding them a little bit better. Uh, and we also looked at how many vulnerabilities are actually exploited in the wild. Uh, so that means that there is an exploit that's, that's used uh, actively out there in, in, in attacks. Um, and uh, uh, at the time when we did this uh, measurement, it was 15%. Only 15% of vulnerabilities have an exploit active in the wild. Uh, but for all the applications that we looked at, this was following a decreasing, uh, a decreasing uh, uh, trend. Uh, so I expect that today this fraction is probably in the single digits. Yes. Okay. Uh, so this leads to a question, you know, because these are the ones that actually are we care about, right? These are the ones that that uh, that are that that are dangerous. So why are some vulnerabilities exploited and others are not? All right. So we would we would like to essentially what we want to do here is we would like to come up with a method um, uh, to to say that to infer that a specific vulnerability is is exploited in the wild. Uh, but without necessarily finding the exploit or before finding the exploit. Uh, and uh, just to show you uh, how, uh, you know, the, the, the challenge uh, for doing this, um, you know, one, uh, one uh, perhaps natural way to do this might be by looking at the CVSS score. So the CVSS is a scoring system that assigns a score for each vulnerability according to how the severity and the exploitability uh, of, of how likely, it, how, how easy it would be to, to, to exploit. And in fact, you know, this is recommended by the, by the NIST for prioritizing patching. So first you prioritize the ones with the high score. So now, uh, we, if we were to do a very simple predictor, so above a certain threshold, we consider this exploited, and below it's not exploited. This is what we will get, so the recall is pretty good, but the precision actually sucks. So the precision is, uh, is the fraction of vulnerabilities that uh, are actually exploited out of the ones that we have predicted that they will be exploited, right? So it does not exceed 9% even if you go to the highest, uh, highest uh, CVSS score. Uh, and, and the reason is that um, Analysts tend to err on the side of caution, so analysts who assign the CVSS score, uh, and they mark many uh, vulnerabilities as, as risky. So this, this introduces lots of false positives. So this is our challenge here. We want to raise this cur curve a little bit higher. Uh, and uh, this is actually one problem that uh, was studied here at UCSD for the first time. So uh, there was a, uh, uh, a paper, um, which actually got a very good accuracy, 90%, uh, in, uh, back in 2010. And when we tried to do this again uh, in, uh, in 2015, uh, we could not get the same, to the same level of accuracy. Right? Uh, and there are two main reasons uh, why, uh, why things have changed. So the, the first reason was that uh, in, in, in this uh, UCSD paper, uh, over 50% of the vulnerabilities uh, were marked as, as, uh, as exploited in the ground truth. Whereas when we were looking at this, we found evidence of exploit for less than 2%, right? So in machine learning terms, this is a problem where you have a high class imbalance and it's really hard to, to, to get a machine learning system to, to work well for, for, for this kind of uh, data set. Uh, but the other issue is that uh, uh, Essentially, the, 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 the prior paper focused on predicting which, uh, which vulnerabilities have, so it did not distinguish between vulnerabilities that just had a proof of constant exploit in, uh, in, in uh, you know, uh, there are databases that, that collect proof of constant exploits. Uh, 
uh, uh, f figuring out which uh, vulnerabilities uh, are active in the wild uh, uh, is, a, is, a little bit, is a little bit trickier. So this is what we actually want to do. Um, so okay, so then our idea was okay. Let's let's try to mine Twitter for this. All right. So uh, this is where I'm starting to talk about machine learning, and uh, you know Twitter has been used to predict movie revenues, the stock market, and many other things. Uh, uh, but it turns out that even uh, it makes sense in the in the case of vulnerability exploitation because uh, we observed leaks from the coordinated disclosure process. So. In this example, this is a vulnerability uh, that, uh, so this, uh, this CVE number, the CVID, which is a unique identifier for, for each vulnerability, was mentioned um, um, several days, so uh, five days before actually the vulnerability was disclosed publicly. Uh, so there are these, these types of leaks, uh, and this is why Twitter turns out to be a reasonable uh, 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 signal for for predicting uh, what happens with these vulnerabilities. So uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about feature engineering. So we looked at um, features that essentially were extracted from the National uh, Vulnerability Database. These are features that are very similar uh, to, to the ones in, in, uh, from the UCSD paper. So there are things like the number of references. If more people write about the vulnerability, it's more likely to be dangerous, uh, the words, uh, we tokenize the words uh, 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 from, from the description of the vulnerability to find out you know, what are important terms that the vulnerability uh, basically indicates capabilities, properties of the, the, the vulnerability. Uh, we also use the, the CVSS based metric. Uh, and then we used uh, features from Twitter. Uh, so uh, these are, uh, word features, so we extracted specific words from, from the tweets that mentioned the, the CV, each CVSS number, uh, each CVE number. Um, and then we also, um, uh, we call them traffic features, so for each uh, vulnerability we looked at the users who were tweeting and then we were computing some aggregates over that. Um, yes? So for these Twitter features, mm -hmm. uh, were you sort of on, on the fire hose or did you how are you able to go back in time? Ah, yeah. Sure, what's something to look yeah. up two years later? Right. So we, we were on the fire hose, but you know we, we had just a regular account which was um, uh, which is rate limited. Uh, however, uh, Twitter in, inserts some messages in the in the stream that indicates when you get rate limited, and we looked for those and we couldn't find them. So we think that we actually have an unsampled corpus of the, the of the discussion on uh, according to, uh, for about vulnerabilities during the period when we were uh, collecting this data. But I guess my question is: Are, are you limiting the features to tweets before disclosure or after disclosure? No. So in this case, uh, this is also a bit of a reactive uh, approach because um, uh, so it's. So we, we group by this, uh, the CV identifier, right? So this is only after, uh, after disclosure, basically, right? Uh, so yeah, so the, the CV identifier needs to exist at least. Right? Um, but yeah, so the, the goal was to, to, to infer that the vulnerability is being exploited before this is known, before the exploit is discovered, basically. Um, and uh, to figure out which vulnerabilities are actually exploited, we used uh, data from Symantec. So uh, Symantec has a nice uh, web page which indicates, which uh, puts the CVE numbers uh, uh, for specific, uh, for sp specific uh, Trojans or specific viruses and specific network attacks. So uh, other people have looked at this and they found the, the best correlation between this and uh, exploit that, that ultimately show up in, um, in exploit kits. So we use this as an indication that these vulnerabilities are actually being exploited in the wild. Um, and uh, uh, we also try to do a um, uh, uh, prediction of proof of concept exploits. But uh, uh, so we train a, a, a linear SVM uh, classifier and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to show you the results for predicting um, uh, exploits in the wild. So, and in particular, how each of the four classes of features 
contributes to our classifier's performance. So this is a precision recall curve. Uh, and uh, as uh, you might expect, given you know, the, the graph I showed you earlier, uh, the CVSS features give us high recall and low precision. Now the features that we extracted from vulnerability databases have a slightly higher precision, but not much higher. So basically they follow the same trend. These give us high recall and low precision. Now the interesting thing is that the tweets have the opposite effect. They have high, uh, low recall, but high precision. The reason why they have low recall is because, well, few vulnerabilities are tweeted about. Um, but they have high precision because those that are tweeted about, those, there's something going on there. So the, the chance is, is, is pretty good. Uh, and then the traffic features actually uh, has the same trend, but again, it allows us to uh, increase the recall a little bit. So now if we put all four together, we get a, a better trade-off between, uh, between precision and recall. Uh, and actually, if, you look, if we look at our, our initial goal to predict earlier, uh, that uh, to infer that something is being exploited in the wild earlier than, than uh, 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 the exploit uh, shows up uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the semantic uh, data, uh, we could, uh, so there were tweets before those dates for about 80% uh, of, the, of the vulnerabilities in our database. Uh, so this is, the, there is an opportunity for early prediction uh, for 80% for and then the median uh, was uh, two days uh, before, uh, uh, before uh, those things uh, were, uh, were published. So two days is interesting, perhaps not that great. Uh, this year, we had a, a, a paper where we showed that we can actually do much better. We can, we just, we, uh, within just days after disclosure, we can predict with only, with I think 90% uh, 90 true positives and 10% false positives. Uh, and uh, we do this by looking at, um, at the patching patterns. So if we have 10 days of, of patching patterns, patching data, um, uh, this is a pretty, pretty nice, pretty good, uh, Signal. So uh, uh, the interesting thing about these these predictions is that so we didn't know it at the time. Uh, we didn't call it cyber risk. Now now it's called cyber risk or <laughs> cyber hygiene. Uh, they have a pretty important application in cyber insurance because um, insurers. So cyber insurance is the fastest growing segment of the insurance industry. It's not 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 super big compared to property insurance, but it's the fastest growing one. Um, and uh, they have a big problem, which is that uh, uh, whenever they come up with some, some model for, for risk, you know, what, what poses you know, risk uh, for, 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 for an organization, uh, and these mean models need to have predictive validity. So we should be able to find you know, we, you know, these, these factors that actually allow us to, to predict things that are going to happen in the wild. Uh, and currently, it is based on questionnaires. So they send these questionnaires to, uh, uh, to the risk managers in the enterprise, and uh, it is still this problem of perceived security, right? So they, you know, the answers to those, those, those questions reflect uh, you know, how those, those uh, professionals perceive that you know, uh, uh, the security uh, uh, of, of, of that organization. So uh, the... Uh, uh, the opportunity here, uh, if we get these things to work well, and not just for exploits, but in general, uh, is to, to go to a data-driven risk modeling. So to, to come up with models that are based on data rather than these uh, 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 subjective opinions. Uh, and our, our work was mainly fo focused on exploitation and, and, and future patching, but there's other interesting uh, work uh, on data breaches and. Uh, uh, website uh, compromise that, that show that these, these predictions are perhaps possible in some, uh, at least for, for cer certain security uh, incidents. All right, but now, so, okay, so we do uh, work that combines essentially artificial intelligence and, and security, right? So at some point, <laughs> we gotta stop and ask ourselves, you know, what could go wrong if we, if we do this sort of thing, right? Um, and I'm going to uh, tell you a couple of things that could go wrong, right? Uh, and again, you know, using my uh, Twitter-based predictor as, a, as an example, so 
I, I, I showed you that, that uh, we have uh, four types of four classes of features uh, and, and what impact they have on the uh, uh, on the on the classifier's performance and the question is you know why you know why why are we able to predict at all you know what is what are these uh, what is the underlying sort of fundamental uh, mechanism that these uh, uh, features are capturing and it turns out that they are capturing something interesting so the, the the features that we extract from vulnerability databases they are Domain-specific features. They are things that are intrinsic properties of the of the vulnerability. Things like, you know, does this an exploit, does this vulnerability enable uh, uh, denial of service, or maybe it enables uh, remote code execution? Well, you know, remote code execution vulnerabilities are more interesting to attackers. Uh, in the Twitter-based uh, features, are essentially features of how the information about vulnerabilities is disseminated. Uh, among the community of uh, hackers and uh, security professionals that discuss vulnerabilities on social media. Uh, and the reason why this is a good signal is because exploitation is difficult. So we've, our, our community has developed a lot of uh, uh, defenses against uh, vulnerability exploitation. Uh, and uh, actually getting an exploit, usually you need a chain of exploits and you, know, you need to bypass ASLR, you need to do a sandbox escape, right? So they require a lot of very specialized skills um, and this tends to generate this sort of uh, chatter and this, this sort of uh, 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 discussions on, on social media that, that turn out to provide uh, good, uh, good signals for, for us. Uh, but basically if we take a step back, uh, this indicates that, so this, this was our feature engineering. I'm trying to I, I explain you know, how uh, the intuition behind, behind our, 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 uh, how we selected our features. Uh, but it is key that whenever you build a, a system, a machine learning system for security, that, uh, that uh, the, your feature engineering uh, actually takes these threat semantics into, into account. And it's, it's really difficult to keep up with the uh, volume of attacks and everything, right? So, can we automate some of some of this? You know, so actually extracting the semantics of threats in a more automated fashion. So that is one problem. And the other problem is that uh, again, if we look at our uh, uh, Twitter predictor, the adversary can send fake tweets. Okay, Twitter is a free and open system. So we had you know three types of adversaries depending on the amount of knowledge about the the our model that they had. Uh, and uh, you know the strongest adversary could basically wipe out the benefit that, that we got from Twitter in terms of early prediction. Um, so, and and again, this is a more general problem because in security, our tools, uh, if they use machine learning, they are going to be trained with some inputs that come from the adversary, right? Uh, so, if you think of a malware detector, it's trained with malware samples which come from the adversary. So. Uh, so this gives the adversary uh, the same opportunity to, to poison the, the system. So we've done work on both these problems, but here in the remaining of my talk, I'm just gonna focus on this, uh, this second one. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to talk about a situation, uh, an attack, where you want to uh, do targeted poisoning, and a targeted poisoning attack. So this is an indiscriminate poisoning because the, the, uh, the adversary's goal was to decrease the overall performance of the system. Uh, but could we actually do a targeted poisoning attack? So just a little bit of background on, uh, so adversarial machine learning is a very hot topic nowadays. So uh, uh, just a little bit of background on these targeted attacks. So the goal here is the adversary wants to induce an error on a specific instance. So one way to do that would be to take your target and mutate it a little bit. So you take your malware sample and you add some things to make it look less malicious to an antivirus, right? So the goal is to make it cross this decision boundary. All right, so this is done in the work on adversarial examples. So for example, this is a panda. If you add some of this especially crafted noise, it still looks like a panda but the machine learning system will detect it with high confidence as a given. Um, in another attack that uh, similarly mutates, uh, so this is a testing time attack, uh, and uh, uh, the trojaning attack is, a, is an example of, of a training time attack where uh, you're, actually modif you're actually changing the model. Um, 
Uh, but here also, yeah, you're adding a trigger so that, and you're, you're teaching your, your models so that if that sees that trigger, it will detect that, it will uh, it produce this, this misprediction. So again, you have to mutate the target in, you know, by adding this, uh, I think they call it, yeah, the trigger, right? Uh, but what if you cannot, if the adversary cannot mutate the target? All right, so let's say that you would like your uh, software developer, you, you would like your, your competitor's app to be, uh, to be detected as malicious right, by, by antiviruses. Uh, well, you cannot do the, with this with these attacks. However, uh, you could do it with a poisoning attack. So if you, if you, if you try to inject some, some, if you try to alter the decision boundary so that it, uh, it actually, uh, it, instead of altering the, the target, then maybe you might be able to do that. All right, so then, you know, let's, let's, let's look at the first attempt. So perhaps one thing you could do is you inject the target with a flipped label, right? So say your target is injected in the training set and it has the wrong label, and then, you know, the, the whole system will learn the wrong, uh, the wrong thing. This is actually a, uh, an assumption that is very often made in, uh, uh, in more theoretical work on, uh, on, uh, uh, on machine learning poisoning, that the adversary can, uh, can inject you know, targets with a flipped label. In practice, though, if you think about it, this is unrealistic, because the adversary does not control, in most practical situations, does not control the, the labeling function. Uh, so then, you know, you, you know, it could create some sort of a malicious sample, but then semantic will determine uh, if this is considered malicious or benign in their ground truth. Okay, so then, uh, let's say maybe he can guess the label. Right, that, uh, okay. Uh, and then try to inject some samples ne near, uh, near, uh, near the target. So we call these clean label poison instances uh, because uh, you know, we don't assume this control over the labeling function, so then uh, you know, the, the attacker considers them that they will actually get the label that the, uh, the defender will give them, but still they are able to push the boundary to uh, surround the target. Uh, but the problem is that you risk uh, creating outliers in this way. So then, uh, you know, the, in particular, there are uh, anti-poisoning defenses. A uh, uh, popular, uh, well-known one is called RONI, reject on negative impact, that essentially try to look for, uh, for uh, uh, samples that have a big effect on the, on the classifier. So they are rejected. Okay, so uh, then, uh, uh, and another problem is that if you don't inject them carefully, uh, so, you, okay, let's say that you run Roni and you filter them out. But still, if you don't, uh, if you don't craft them very carefully, you risk changing the boundary, the decision boundary in such a way that there's a lot of collateral damage, right? So the, the accuracy of the classifier goes down, and then it's no longer a targeted attack. It's perhaps detectable simply because you have messed up the, the, uh, uh, the accuracy of the, of the classifier. So uh, in, in, uh, realistically, if you want to do a targeted poisoning attack, you actually have to, uh, have, to uh, uh, you know, have these three constraints. So the, the adversary cannot control how the poisons are labeled. Uh, this, this, this is the clean label constraint. The, the poisons uh, are individually inconspicuous, so they don't uh, represent outliers. And they are also collectively inconspicuous, meaning that it doesn't, they do not uh, decrease the overall accuracy of the, of the system by, by a lot. Um, so essentially, the key idea for doing that is that we take uh, a few instances that already exist in the training set. We call these the base instances. And we, each one of them, we mutate it a little bit to, uh, by adding some features of the target. Uh, and then collectively, these will push the boundary uh, of the classifier, but at the same time, they will remain uh, very similar uh, to the existing uh, samples in the ground truth, so they will not be uh, considered, um, um, uh, they will not be considered uh, outliers. Uh, it's unlikely that they would, would, uh, would uh, be considered outliers. Uh, so we have two attacks, and so one of them uh, is a black box attack we presented at Usenix Security in August, and uh, the other one is a white box attack that we will uh, present at NIPS in, uh, 
uh, in December. Uh, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about what the white box attack. Uh, so uh, 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 in, in this case, so in the white box attack, the attacker knows the, uh, the target, that, that uh, the model knows the, uh, the, the exact model. Uh, and also, uh, in, uh, we assumed here the transfer learning setting, which is uh, you're just retraining one layer. So typically, it's the final output layer of the model. Uh, the rest of the model you know, remains the same. Uh, and then, uh, you know, with these assumptions, we could formulate this as an optimization problem. So, F uh, here is the um, uh, it's the the function that that re represents the output of the of the penult penultimate layer, the feature layer, and you know uh, this is the distance in the feature space. So basically, we want to craft. Uh, so starting from a base, uh, we want to craft a sample that is close to the base in the pixel space and close to the target in the feature space. And if we have this F, you know, uh, in transfer learning, uh, we have this F, right? So we can formulate this as an optimization problem. Uh, so, uh, uh, so let me just give you a few examples of, uh, uh, of what you can get. Uh, so, um, in this case, you know, we're, so uh, we, we did this for image recognition. So this is the base, okay? These are the poisons that we created, starting from the base. And each one of them sort of uh, allowed, you know, made the classifier detect, uh, uh, right, so made the, this fish be detected as a dog. So, each of we, so we could make each of these fish images get a dog detection from the classifier by injecting these poisons. And in, in this sort of white box transfer learning setting, we could usually do this with a single poison instance. And you can see that, uh, so these are the poison instances. Y you would say that this is a dog picture, right? So they, you know, they, they, this is the clean label constraint, right? So you, you couldn't, you know, you, you, you're not assuming a flipped label here. And, and same, same uh, story here for the dog, uh, dog class. Um, yeah, I'm, re I'm running out of time, so uh, maybe I'm going to skip over the uh, the black box. Uh, one thing I want to say is that another thing that we did is that in addition to coming up with these constraints for targeted poisoning, uh, we also uh, try to define an adversary model for machine learning. So one of the problems is that uh, very often uh, machine learning, uh, these attacks, you know, they're kind of hard to compare apples to apples because they make very different and sometimes implicit assumptions about what the ad adversary knows and what the adversary can control. So we came up with this model that we call FAIL, right? So <laughs> FAIL stands for, you know, does the adversary know all the features that you're using for, for, for classifying? Uh, uh, does the adversary know the actual algorithm uh, or the, the model or maybe the model architecture? Uh, in the case of poisoning, does the, the adversary know all the instances in the training set? Uh, and leverage means that can the adversary control, change all the features of, of, uh, of, uh, when crafting poisons? So in the adversarial machine learning literature, there's a concept called transferability, which uh, uh, basically shows that uh, even if you are crafting your uh, adversary examples on a model that is only a, an approximation, and so it's somewhat different from, from the model that, that you're attacking, you can still, uh, you can still uh, uh, craft those uh, instances in some case. So this basically is our algorithms, is the A dimension. So by looking at more dimensions like this, we get what we call generalized transferability, uh, and you know, this shows you that you can, uh, you, know, you can overestimate a lot the success rate of an, uh, of, of an attack, uh, if you uh, if you make uh, these uh, these assumptions uh, uh, that that you have full knowledge um, and full leverage, uh, and you can also compare. Uh, so I'm going to go really quickly. Like you know, you know, you ask me later. Like if you want details about this, but you also compare the impact on of each uh, dimension on the success of the adversary. Um, and uh, the other cool thing is that. If we looked at previous papers that were published uh, in the adversarial machine learning community, and we could actually classify the assumptions that they made according to, to, our, uh, to our fail model. 
and we expose some, some implicit assumptions as well. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, we show that targeted poisoning is actually, it's, it's, it's realistic, and it's also practical for, for, uh, for weak uh, adversaries who don't have, uh, uh, you know, perfect knowledge of the model under attack and are constrained by this requirement to, to having conspicuous samples and clean labels. Uh, and uh, uh, basically this is a, an, an example that, uh, you know, we, you know if, if we wanted to um, uh, move forward with defenses against adversarial uh, attacks in machine learning, uh, I think, you know, the security community has a has nice pattern of actually, you know, requiring, you know, precise, uh, precise adversary models uh, whenever you're trying to think of, of how to defend against certain attacks. So I just, you know, want to take three more minutes to take a step back and, and uh, try to think about, you know, like, you know, what are some promising directions right now uh, in, uh, in security? So uh, I told you about this, this work on, uh, uh, on global and systematic measurements. Um, so, uh, you know, we're not the only ones doing this. So like I mentioned, you know, there's this, this work on uh, using internet-wide scans uh, uh, in order to understand the life cycle of server-side vulnerabilities as well as uh, abuses of, of uh, web certificates. Uh, so I told you about our, our work on wine and life cycle of client-side vulnerabilities, uh, but we also did other things in this, uh, in this area. Uh, in particular, we have uh, collected code signing certificates, and we have started looking into uh, a very interesting ecosystem of abuse in the code signing PKI. Again, these are things that you know, are hard to collect using, using network scanning, and it turns out that they have different properties uh, than, uh, than the web certificates, which make them which make them interesting in, in, in some very specific ways. Uh, so, you know, some of the open questions, uh, you know, one big question that I'm, I'm, I'm wondering is, you know, we, we, uh, whenever we analyze malware, uh, malware behaviors, creating uh, detections, um, um, we always run the sample in a sandbox. And it is known that malware has these evasive behaviors, right, to make it, you know, detecting sandboxes and, you know, avoiding, you know, being, uh, uh, you know, doing the malicious stuff in a, in a sandbox. So it's kind of an open question, like, just how different, you know, the, the, these behaviors are in the wild versus uh, in, in sandboxes. And I think that if we could, uh, if we could characterize these differences, I think that that, that, would, uh, that would lead to sort of very interesting uh, future directions. Uh, and another observation is that the work on uh, the measurement work that was done starting maybe five or six years ago um, on abuse uh, of web, uh, web certificates, the web PKI, uh, has led to a lot of efforts to improve security in that ecosystem. Things like uh, the Let's Encrypt CA with automated uh, uh, revocation and reissuing mechanisms, uh, or uh, you know, certificate transparency, Dane, um, and uh, and um, some of these techniques do not really apply to the code signing uh, PKI. So how, you know, I think that's going to be a, a next challenge over the next few years. Now that we started understanding the patterns of abuse and the problems. How are we gonna, you know, how are we gonna, what are we gonna do about those? Uh, another one, uh, which I know that there's a lot of active work here at, uh, uh, at UCSD is, is, uh, is doing these security predictions. Uh, so there's work on uh, data breaches, uh, website compromise, uh, user exposure to, to malicious content, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, one of the interesting questions that I've kind of alluded to is um, our current methods of inferring exploitation are kind of reactive. So some of the signals you know, appear only after the fact, right? But then, you know, the, the utility of, of our, our, our patching patterns that we observed in our recent paper suggests that perhaps, you know, this is actually something that might allow us to predict uh, in the future, which vulnerabilities are going to be exploited in the future, perhaps by looking at differences across, in patching patterns across, across hosts. Um, and uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, the security of machine learning, 
well, this is actually a very hot uh, area. I'm not gonna mention any, <laughs> it would take like several slides just to mention the related work here. Uh, uh, but uh, one observation it is that it's a very heated arms race. We don't have very good defenses. Uh, and usually when a defense is proposed, it is very quickly bypassed. Um, in particular, we don't have very good defenses for poisoning attacks right now. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of interesting uh, open questions here. So how, how can we defend against poisoning, in particular against targeted poisoning? Because this, this seems to sort of uh, fall outside, outside the scope of, of the existing uh, assumptions of, of, um, uh, of anti-poisoning defenses. Um, can we take a page from the book of uh, trustworthy computing, which um, essentially says that you have a root of trust. So the, the trust uh, in the system comes from outside of the system. It's not created. So you trust some sort of third party uh, or some sort of uh, uh, hardware component like a TPM. Um, and then from that, you can design protocols that will ensure that even if the rest of your system is compromised, the protocol's integrity, you can, you can ensure it as long as these, these trusted components uh, uh, are, not, are not hacked. Uh, so can we extend this? Because in, in, in the case of machine learning, you very often have a small set of instances that you can trust. You, they have been manually vetted, right? Uh, and right now, this, so this information is, is orthogonal to the information about the distribution of, of the data. Uh, and it's, it's currently not, not taken into account into machine learning pipelines. So can we, can we do this, the, the, you know, can, uh, can we take this analogy uh, of trying to look at uh, a few trusted data points and then extending this to, to the rest of the system? Um, so figuring out, for example, which predictions are trustworthy and which are not. Uh, we're also starting looking a little bit into the structural information of uh, deep neural networks. Actually, this, this actually, it's very interesting because it often exposes internal, uh, internal uh, confusion uh, where layers disagree on what the decision should be, um, as well as exploring alternative attack vectors. So we're having a lot of fun recently with trying to look at side channels, things like uh, cache-based side channels to extract information about a, a, a running model, kind of the way you know, people have shown that this can be used to extract RSA keys and stuff like that. Uh, as well as using uh, row hammer to insert trojans into a running model. So, and we also looked a little bit into, into whether bugs in machine learning code uh, can actually help the adversary, can, can, can uh, provide you know, b uh, better capabilities for evasion and, uh, and, 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 and poisoning. All right, so I think uh, having said that, uh, I thank you for, uh, for your attention, and uh, uh, I'm ready to answer more questions if you'd like. So we, we did look at that. Some of them were actually bots. Uh, so often what happens is that uh, you have all these bots that retweet, for example, commits, right, GitHub commits. Uh, sometimes a commit would say, this fixes CV, whatever. Right? So you'll get it. Um, but the other thing that we did is we actually looked at um, uh, the mutual information. So the mutual information is a way to determine which uh, 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 which of, uh, of, uh, of these sort of data sources uh, provide, you know, help the, uh, the classification the most. And we saw that pretty much most of our performance comes from a very small set of users. Um, I think it was maybe like a thousand or maybe 2,000 Twitter users. Uh, and the bots were not among those. Uh, and this is what actually gave us this idea of um, you know, if we can trust some of those users, if some of those users are actually the trusted ones, uh, you know, th this would be a, a defense against, uh, against the kind of poisoning attacks that we, we demonstrated in the paper. Okay. Further questions? Okay. All right. Uh, Thank you.